Hello everyone, so here we are once again talking about things sliding down spheres. It seems there's a lot we can learn by studying this sort of system and it's something that I've talked about on various occasions in the past. So today we're going to look at this classic physics problem from a different perspective than we usually do. Uh, if you haven't come across this problem before, the idea is that you have a particle sitting at the top of a sphere and you give it a little nudge so that it starts sliding down from rest and the sphere has radius r and we want to find the uh, the angle labeled as theta on this diagram at which the particle loses contact with the surface of the sphere. Now the standard approach for something like this would be to consider the forces acting on the particle and then you find the angle at which the normal contact force between the surface of the sphere and the particle just becomes zero and you say that that angle is the angle at which uh, the particle loses contact. Now there's nothing wrong with that method, it's a perfectly good method but it's always good to consider things from alternative viewpoints and so I've specified in my problem statement here that we want to do this without considering the normal contact force. Now the first thing we're going to do is consider the shape of the trajectory that the particle would follow if it were to leave the surface of the sphere at some arbitrary angle theta. That's why I've sketched on this Cartesian coordinate system on the diagram because if we're going to describe a trajectory then we need some coordinate system and this seems like a sensible uh, choice of coordinate system. Now in order to know the shape of the trajectory we need to know the initial state of motion of the particle and initially it's moving in a circle, right? It's been sliding down the surface of the sphere and so the velocity is always directed tangentially um, to the surface and so I can draw a velocity arrow kind of going like that um, which is in the tangential direction and uh, using the fact that the angle between a radius and a tangent is 90 degrees so this angle here is 90 degrees if you work through a bit of geometry you should be able to convince yourself that the angle between this velocity v and the x-axis is also theta. So I've just written out suvat twice because as soon as the particle loses contact with the sphere it's going to be in free fall the only force acting on it will be its own weight so it's going to have a constant acceleration of g in the downwards direction therefore we can apply our constant acceleration equations um, in the x and y directions independently so let's write down what we know about s u v a and t in both of those directions. Now just to avoid any potential confusion I want to point out one slight notational issue that we have involving the u's and the v's and this stems from the fact that there are two separate phases of the motion. Um, we could say phase one is where the particle is moving along an arc of a circle and phase two is where it starts behaving as a projectile. Now the v that I marked onto the diagram is the final velocity of phase one of the motion but it's also the initial velocity of phase two of the motion and the conclusion is that the v on the diagram is going to determine what we use as u in our constant acceleration equations. So anyway in the x direction by definition the displacement s is simply the x coordinate the value of u is the projection of the vector v onto the x-axis and that straightforwardly is just v uh, cos theta. Now v meaning the final velocity of the projectile motion we don't know and we don't care about so I'm just going to put a little dash there. The acceleration is zero because the only force acting is the weight that's acting straight down and I'm just going to keep the time as t it's going to be a useful uh, parameter. Now in the y direction again the displacement is simply y. The initial velocity well, it has magnitude v sine theta because you're projecting v onto the y-axis, but because y is defined uh, such that upwards is positive, we have to say minus um, v sine theta. Similarly, the final velocity, we don't know and we don't care about it. The acceleration is minus g, again minus because accelerating downwards, and uh, let's just keep the time as uh, t. So what equations of motion can we get out of these parameters? Well, in the x direction it's very simple because the acceleration is zero. So you can think about s is ut plus a half at squared, or even more simply just think about um, distance equals speed times time, and you get x equals v uh, cos theta times t. And what we're going to do is rearrange for t, which is of course x over v cos theta, and then we're going to be able to substitute that into our equation for y as a function of t and then we'll get y as a function of x. So let's come up with an equation for y. We're going to use s equals ut plus a half at squared and you get y equals minus v sine theta times t and then minus half gt squared. Then as we said we're going to just substitute t for uh, x over v cos theta. You're going to get y equals well minus v sine theta um, times x over v cos theta. The v's cancel and sine theta over cos theta is tan theta, so it's going to be minus tan theta x. Then you're going to get uh, a big fraction as your next term. Uh, it's going to be minus, you've got a g on the top, you're going to have a 2 on the bottom, you're also going to have a v squared cos squared theta 
from your t in terms of x, and then all of that is the coefficient of x squared. So we've got our Cartesian equation, y in terms of x for the trajectory, and what we're going to do is use this formula that I've just quoted to find the radius of curvature of the trajectory. Now, this will look familiar if you've seen uh, one of my other recent videos. The basic idea is that we are approximating the shape of the trajectory locally as a circle, and this is a formula that gives the radius of that circle. Essentially what's going on is we've got our particle following some curved uh, trajectory, it looks something like this blue arrow that I've just added onto the diagram, and it seems reasonable that you can approximate that um, as a circle, and you can kind of see that the center of that circle would have to lie somewhere along this blue line, this diameter um, of the actual sphere. Now in this formula, a dash denotes a derivative with respect to x, and so the radius of curvature is going to vary along the trajectory. We specifically care about the point where it leaves the surface, and so I'm just going to put a little x equals zero down there to remind us of that. Um, and so to evaluate this, we need to differentiate y twice, so let's do that. y dash is going to be your first term just becomes minus tan theta because that's a constant. Second term, just use a power rule, get a factor of 2 from the x squared, cancels with the denominator, and you get g over b squared cos squared theta um, times x. Then you want to differentiate again to find the second derivative. The first term disappears. The second term, you just get the coefficient of x, right? So it's just minus g over b squared cos squared theta. Notice, by the way, that the first derivative depends on x, whereas the second derivative is a constant which is independent of x, which is a general feature of a parabola. So let's put all these results together and figure out a simplified version of rc, the radius of curvature. So I'm just going to substitute these various expressions in. It's going to be the modulus of 1 plus something squared. That something is y dash, but we just substitute x equals 0 and the second term disappears, right? So it's actually 1 plus tan squared of theta, uh, all to the power of 3 over 2. That has to be divided by the second derivative, so we're going to end up with a minus g on the bottom and then a v squared uh, cos squared theta um, on the top. Then we can use a nice trig identity that says 1 plus tan squared is sec squared, and then you do sec squared to the power of 3 over 2 and you get sec cubed, right? So if we put all of that together, you've got your v squared over g, the minus sign disappears because we're taking the modulus, and then you've got that sec cubed factor, um, and then a cos squared factor. And by definition, the sec is 1 over cos, and this simplifies very nicely to just v squared over g cos theta. Now let's just take a moment to think about how exactly this expression varies with theta. The numerator is v squared, and you can kind of see intuitively that v squared is going to increase with theta because the particle is always being pulled downwards, so it's always going to be speeding up as it slides down. Now the denominator, uh, cos theta, is a decreasing function of theta, uh, from 0 to 90 degrees at least, and so you've got an increasing function on the top, a decreasing function on the bottom, that combines to mean that RC definitely increases uh, as theta increases. So this radius of curvature is continuously increasing, and there'll therefore come a point when the radius of curvature is equal to R, which is the radius of the sphere itself. At that point, if you can visualize what that trajectory would look like, it would no longer be trying to move sort of into the sphere, it would no longer be trying to push into the sphere, and therefore it's going to lose contact um, at that position. And so all we have to do is take this v squared of g cos theta and set that equal to r, and we get a condition for v squared, right? So it leaves when uh, v squared is equal to g r cos theta. Now we can actually get another condition on v squared because the kinetic energy is half mv squared, and so considering the conservation of energy, setting the gain in kinetic energy of the particle uh, equal to the decrease in gravitational potential energy as it slides down, ends up giving us this expression here, v squared is 2gr to 1 minus cos theta. I won't go through the full derivation of that because I've done that in uh, past videos. If you've done this kind of problem enough times, you can probably see where that comes from. But in any case, this is what we end up with, and it's valid to do this if we ignore frictional forces because there's no uh, dissipative forces acting. Um, now we have two simultaneous equations for v squared and theta, and we can just eliminate v squared by equating the right-hand side of those two equations. So here's the equation that we get. You see that the grs cancel nicely from both sides, and you end up with cos theta equals 2 minus 2 cos theta. Put the cos thetas on the same side, you get 3 cos theta is 2, divide by the 3, and you get cos theta is 2 thirds. Then, of course, that implies that theta itself is simply the inverse cosine of 2 thirds, and that agrees with uh, the result that we get when we use the more traditional normal contact force based method. So there we have it. I hope this has helped you to see things from a slightly different perspective. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.